Hello, hi, is this Sage? Yeah, it is. Hi, Jerry. Sage Stoneman, it's Jerry Katz. How's it going hi. there? I'm good, how are you? Good, yeah, how's, uh, how's California? You don't have any snow like we do, I guess. No snow. Some snow up in the mountains. Oh, in the mountains there would be, yeah. Yeah, I live, uh, I live in Ojai, and it's a valley here, so we're surrounded by mountains, and up at the top of the mountains we get a little bit of snow. Yeah, so you can always go up to the snow if you want. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I lived in Los Angeles, so I remember on really clear days. Uh, I don't know what it's like now. This was years ago. You could you could be on the beach, like in Santa Monica, and see these snow-capped mountains of, uh, you know, behind you. I guess that was uh, Big Bear and those, those areas. Yeah, it's pretty wild being on the beach and seeing snow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When the, you know, when you had a clear day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've only seen it a couple of times in my life, but I kind of grew, grew up there. I, I only, I probably only saw it a couple of times when it would be clear enough that you could actually, uh, you know, see the uh, snow mountains. Yeah, pretty unusual. So, can you sort of introduce yourself? Kind of give a brief introduction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go, go for it. Well, my name is Sage Stoneman. Um, I, well, let's see. I'm, I'm not sure how much of this story is important, but uh, I was born in New Jersey, moved to Ojai when I was about three. Um, I'm still living in Ojai now. Um, I'm 18 years old, and I'm living at the Krishnamurti Foundation of America. Um, where they recently started an internship program, although internship is kind of a misleading word for it. Um, Why? Just because usually an internship, I think, implies like that you work in a position at some kind of company or some kind of job, and then you get promoted at the end of the internship, or that there's some outcome. Um, like some status that you gain through the internship, but that doesn't really happen here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's more like a work study program, or um, I know that there's a, a word that Buddhists use called sangha, which mm. I actually feel um, explains the general idea of living here better than any other word. Because it's like a, uh, it's like a community in which you live, and everyone helps each other to remember, kind of what they already know, but that is easy to forget. And everyone helps each other remain attentive and um, just aware of, you know, what thoughts are at play and and what's going on. So basically, um, I live here, and I. I I do a certain amount of work and I have my own room and have like a food allowance. And then I also am living amongst people who are all interested in inquiring and exploring the general nature of consciousness and thought and, and beingness and, and just what, what's really going on here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what, you know, you gave a great definition, I think of, of Sangha, very, very concise. How long have you been there and how long, do you plan to stay then as part of this internship? Well, it's been about four months, and the internship is a year long. So I'll be here until October. And how about the other people? How many other people are part of the are also doing an internship? Are they around, you know, different ages? Or t tell me something about them in general. Yeah, right now there are four other interns. Um, three of them are from the East Coast of America. Uh, Maryland, New York, and Philadelphia. And then there is a new intern who just joined, and he came from Tijuana. And I'm the youngest of the interns. Uh, there are two 24-year-olds, one 28-year-old, and another 27-year-old. And uh, there's also one girl, and the other four are, are men. Um and so, yeah, I'm, I'm considerably younger than the other interns. 
And so who else lives at the Krishnamurti? Is, say what exactly what it is again, Krishnamurti Foundation? or? Yeah, it's, it's the official title is the Krishnamurti Foundation of America. Okay. So, um, there, there's one in India, one in Spain, and one in England. Um, and so they basically are responsible for keeping Krishnamurti's work alive. And they hold the copyrights to his work and, and create contracts with publishing companies around the world so that people can have access to Krishnamurti's teachings, basically. So there, um, so we know there are five interns there at Krishnamurti Foundation of America. So tell me, give me a, bit, a little bit bigger picture then of the foundation. Who else is there? And, you know, well, we have, uh, as far as, residents go there's only one other resident his name is michael cronin and he was krishnamurti's personal chef for a few years Mm -hmm. Uh, and so krishnamurti used to live here when he was in ojai and uh so michael would cook for him when he was here and michael has stayed here ever since then and he's kind of like uh he works in the library here and he's a um like a just a general like caretaker of the foundation um now i know krishnamurti had a house there i and i've been to the oak grove there to hear him speak and i never was to his house i've seen pictures of it so hmm. where you live is it actually that house or some addition to it or or what yeah it is actually that house um my room is separate from that it's uh just across on the other side of the property um So I have my own room that I sleep in, but it's very small and I, I cook and eat and, um, spend a lot of time in the pine cottage, which is where Krishnamurti lived. What's your typical day like Sage? Um, well, I will wake up (laughs) and go to breakfast at the pepper tree retreat, which is like a kind of a bed and breakfast retreat for people to come and and just take some time away from their daily life and also study Krishnamurti's work if they're interested. Um, So I go to breakfast there usually, Mm -hmm. and some mornings I work there, setting up breakfast and helping the guests and cleaning up. Um, And then lunch is at 1 o'clock, and on some days I'll cook lunch, so I would start cooking at 11 and cook for two hours. And then we uh, eat lunch with staff members and the other interns. So that's really nice because we all get to come together at least for that one time every day um, and eat lunch together. And then uh, if I'm not working in the retreat in the morning or cooking, then I'll do work with publications, which is um, just like it's online work managing contracts and things with publishing companies. And I also am starting a vegetable garden here. So that's another place that I, I spend time. Yeah, all those things, I guess, can, can keep you pretty busy. And so do the other interns, I guess, do they have similar tasks? Or do they have different jobs? Like yours involves publications. Um, the Some of the jobs overlap. There's another intern involved with publications. Um, but one of, one of them works in the orange orchards here, uh, maintaining the orchards and doing other maintenance work. Uh, one of them works doing book orders. Um, so there, there are different, there's different jobs for all of us. We, we all have like our main field, uh, our area of work and then other things overlap. And then we have a lot of, uh, free time as well in the evenings and that's nice for me because i grew up here in ojai so i still have a lot of friends here that i like to spend time with yeah yeah you can go you can go out and party basically yeah (laughs) i was actually i was actually thinking the same thing i was like wow i said that uh, pretty officially but what i really mean is that i like to party (laughs) yeah right 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 (laughs) Well, I mean, you know, so did Krishnamurti, probably. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. 
Now, you mentioned you were talking about Sangha, and, and that this is, um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to repeat what you said exactly, but it was basically a group of people, and what they have in common is, um, you know, this love or, you know, deep interest in inquiry, you know, inquiring as, as, to, their, as to their true nature. Now, those are my words anyway. So is there a time where you kind of get together and just, you know, sit or be or? Well, we do have um, a couple of scheduled programs that happen throughout the year. We had a dialogue group, a uh, seven week course where we would meet um, twice a week and watch a Krishnamurti video and then just have a, a discussion or a dialogue, as they call it here, about um, different topics such as listening or, or conflict or, um, you know, things, things like that where we can really like come together and look at something and share rather than just, um, rather than just like repeating ideas that we've created and, um, opposing each other's ideas and making it about opinions or disagreements. We have a time to, set all that aside and and really understand what's creating those ideas what thoughts are behind them where the belief is coming from and set them aside so that we're able to just look at something together it, like in in the living moment as it's happening rather than making it theoretical or idealistic although although that does happen <laughs> a lot in dialogue groups, you know, it's, it's, it tends to be difficult for everyone to set aside their, their ideas, you know, even if it is, even if it is an idea of, of oneness or non-duality and, and totality and wholeness, even those ideas I have found just recently to kind of impede my own, like further growth and understanding of, of my own, of my own thought you know, the way that my thoughts are controlling my actions and things. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Can you go a little further into that? How these thoughts, you know, these con they thought oh, they become concepts, non-duality, totality. Yeah. That's... How they become impediments. Can you go a little, would you like to go a little further into that? Yeah, I would actually love to, because that's kind of a new thing for me. Um, I guess I can give some kind of a background story leading up to that. When I was uh, when I was a freshman, no, when I was a sophomore in high school, so I was about fifteen. My dad was reading "I Am That" by Nizargadatta. Um, well, it's not by Nizargadatta, but it contains, uh, you know, talks with him that 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 people came and asked mm -hmm. him questions, and the talks were recorded. Um, and he was reading that, and I read some of that and became very interested in it. So I read that whole book, and that kind of got me started into like an understanding of, of non-duality, um, as, as people refer to it. Um, before that, I had always, you know, growing up with my dad, who, had, who, who uh, followed Ramana Maharshi's teachings for most of his life, I was always exposed to you know, that general type of inquiry. I remember being like, like 10 or maybe 12 years old. And, and my dad, and I just want to interrupt your dad is Raphael Stoneman, who I, I interviewed recently. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. Dad. You go ahead. Um, and he, I remember him, him telling me about Ramana's teachings and asking and offering uh, the invitation to me to ask myself, who am I? And, and so I actually got into that inquiry. I remember this, I have this vivid memory of it actually, mm. of being in his truck at the gas station and he brought it up and he was talking about, you know, asking who am I and then asking who's asking that and, and really looking for the source of this questioning and the source of this identity and, and, you know, what's actually creating this idea of a separative individual. And I, and I actually, <laughs> like, it actually made sense to me <laughs> just, mm. just right there from asking that question that there was something more than just the idea or the image I had of myself um, and that, that I'm, I must be something more than that. 
or or uh, yeah, something more whole than just this this little this little idea of, of sage. <laughs> um, so that was some, that was sounds like it was a real turning point in your life. Yeah, it definitely. I mean, it definitely made me question everything, you know. Um, and then from there, and even even when I was younger, I, I remember asking my dad about God, and he would tell me that God is everything. <laughs> and yeah. I and I always I remember really liking liking that idea, even you know as like a very young kid. Uh, yeah, it, it made some sense to you. You mean? Yeah, absolutely. I mean it. I, I've ne- never at any point did I understand the idea that God, whatever we call God, could be contained in something apart from what I am or apart from what anything is. Yeah, that was just your, your, your you know, natural kind of knowing. Yeah, it just, it just seemed kind of, it just seemed obvious. And, and that might come from, you know, hearing my dad say that. You know, it could have been part of just the conditioning, but but it it, it de- definitely like it felt like it had tr- truth behind it. You know, when yeah. it said God is everything, it, it just made sense. <laughs> so that same that same feeling of truth kind of came to me through I am that when I was reading it. I just I kind of was I was so willing and ready just to accept everything that I read in that book. As, as being true in some way. And I even remember reading, you know, Nizar Gadada said that um, his guru told him that he's not what he thinks he is, and he, and he took his word for it. And, and within three years, I guess he gave that time frame to it. He had, uh, you know, been enlightened or liberated or, you know, free from whatever idea he had of himself. Um, and I remember thinking just like, okay, I, I'll believe you, Nizagadatta. <laughs> I'm yeah. not what I think I am. <laughs> uh-huh. And like that, reading that at 15 kind of cut off like most of the ambition that might have developed, like ambition to create an image for myself in the world or to to achieve some level of success that, you know, it seems like many people strive for. Um, so that never really became part of, um, part of my life, really. The intention to be successful never really came. Um, and let's see, what am I saying? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean the original question was was the impediments of the concepts of right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm getting there. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, that first of all, that was interesting being in high school reading that book, and then also, you know, dealing with you know having crushes on girls and and wanting to go to parties and drink and smoke and and like hang out with friends and having all these desires and like the usual things that most teenagers seem to be interested in but then at the same time also reading a book that tells me that none of these experiences are real and and the only reality is that which i am beyond any concept of myself in relation to a world that is just made up through ideas (laughs) yeah so 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 with that and i always had that in mind in any in any social endeavors uh throughout high school um, and that, uh, developed into like, like a truth for me. It, it became true that, that there is only one and all that is, is that, and there are no distinctions. So it sounds like that became more of the foreground than all the social stuff. Yes, absolutely. That, Which is that, really that, unusual because when you're young, I mean, the social stuff is pretty powerful. Yeah, it is. And I still, I mean, still I would, you know, fall for girls and, and go through that whole thing and, and you know, be discontented by not being able to go to a party I wanted to go to or, you know, all of these types of things. But always, like, 
the idea that what I am is beyond all of this took precedence over those concerns. Um, and so I think that's great. And that freed me from a lot of like, just a lot of these ideas that I could gain something from, ex from these experiences. Um, but recently, I guess, let's see, it, it kind of started for me with, I went to the science and non-duality conference this year, oh. um, right before I started the internship here. And I really enjoyed that conference, but it was also very strange for me to see so many people talking about and selling non-duality mm. because there, there are many people there that make a living off of saying these things that I had been saying throughout all, my whole high school experience. And I kind of like got this sense of exploitation and like even like a religious feeling about it. It almost, and, and that was the first time that I saw this idea of non-duality as kind of being still just a concept that can be worshipped like any other religion. Mm -hmm. So that kind of opened me up to like challenging even, even like even that idea in myself. And that doesn't, that's not to say at all that I, you know, like discarded any of that, any of that, um, that knowledge or any of that understanding. I still feel very much the same way that I can't separate myself from any, anything and that I don't exist, you know, s apart from anything. But I also have seen that if that becomes a truth, or if I think that truth lies in that statement, then that's it. Then I just have this truth and I might still be discontent and I might still, you know, suffer and, and be upset at times, but then like discredit the, the suffering as just being part of all that is. So that, that is, is a very recent turning point for me where it went from like seeing all thoughts, even thoughts of separation and seeking as being a part of absolute reality and in that part containing the whole of absolute reality because it's completely inseparable from anything <laughs> to seeing that in in doing that i'm i'm creating i'm kind of creating an ideal and 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 not allowing myself to understand the thoughts that are causing me discontentment because if i just excuse them as being the absolute reality and there's nothing wrong with them because there's no problem ever because everything is one then i might still i might still be upset that i didn't get to go to a party even though i know that that upset that uh that discontentment is just what is i still don't have the opportunity to understand it and and like kind of create the space uh, to see it in operation, um, which has now become something that I really feel is important for me to do and I really enjoy doing. You said recent discovery or understanding. Did that come out of, uh, is that, was that one of the great benefits so far of being an intern, of working in that environment, do you think? Yeah, well, I'm not, I wouldn't say that the the discovery or the understanding came from being here, but I would say that it, it's had a, um, a great, like it's able to blossom here and it's able to be looked at um, because I feel like any discovery that happens for me isn't actually dependent on any external circumstance. It's all coming from me. Um, you know, I, I couldn't attribute any understanding to being here but i would say that this understanding that came just from looking at my own thoughts and experiences is now i'm now in a perfect environment to continue exploring that and looking at it 
And that's where the song idea um, plays its part because I've been talking about this with all of the people I live with and, and, and really going deeply into it with them. What does is, what is that involve going deeply into it? Just looking at their own life experiences and reactions to things? Yeah, we, were, we had a, a discussion the other night because um, I was here with two of the other interns and we were eating together and there was a, a dance party going on for a friend's birthday. And so I, I wanted to go. <laughs> I wanted to go to this dance party, but I also kind of wanted to just stay here. And so we can take a simple example like that and explore it. And that's, that's what I did with um, Zach and Francesca are their names, two of the interns that I was talking with. So I was looking at it and I saw that that the, I, the option of going to a dance party and the appeal in that option was coming from an idea that I have of myself as being someone that enjoys dancing and meeting people at parties and, and all of this. And it, and it was only, it was only to fulfill that idea of myself that I would actually go. And when I really looked closely at, what I was experiencing in that moment, there was no part of me that really actually wanted to go to the dance party. I, I was completely content where I was. So in seeing this and exploring it together with Zach and Francesca and talking about it, I see, and, and this has been a recurring observation in myself, that right now, here, right now, is total, perfect contentment and totality of being, and it's and it's right here. There's, there's, it's, it's right in my face, as obvious as anything. And when I see that, it's very clear, and there's no mistaking that I'm perfectly content as I am. I'm whole and complete. Nothing can be added to what I am through any experience. But then, every once in a while, or sometimes more often than not, thought creates contentment in ideas that aren't here. So, in this example, thought created the idea that a dance party has the contentment that is already right here in it. And for me to for me to have that contentment, I need to go to the dance party. And when that happens, thought has taken the contentment out of this moment and put it into an idea, leaving me feeling like I'm not content anymore. Mm -hmm. And so recently I've just been seeing um, like the sacrifice, how great that sacrifice is to actually create contentment in anything other than what is right here, because it keeps happening. <laughs> and when it isn't happening, it's so obvious that I would never want anything other than what I already am. But then somehow these thoughts come back and say that there is something more than just what I already am. And there is a reason for me to go do this thing or meet these people because it will bring me some satisfaction. Um, and the other thing about that is that if I look at this phenomenon through thought, it seems as though there is no way to be content without creating contentment in other ideas. Mm -hmm. So it's like... It's like thought tries to say that I need thing need these things to be content, but it's only it thought only even has like an understanding of contentment because there is only contentment here already. <laughs> mm. I I basically have seen like the vital importance of not allowing thought to keep creating discontentment out of nothing.
it takes um, a certain kind of attention for me to to catch my thoughts that are doing that. You know, as soon as as soon as some kind of discontentment is experienced, there's this certain attention that I can give um, that doesn't em- doesn't employ thought. I don't need I don't need um, to think about this in the way that I think about other things. It's more of just a looking. And I look at what is actually happening that is the source of that cont- discontentment. And I can see every time that it's just some thought that is telling me that contentment exists somewhere other than where I am. And in seeing that, I'm immediately, there, there's immediately space created so that I don't, that I, so that I'm not affected by that idea. And I can see that I already am perfect contentment. And yet we act and we do things and talk about the discernment then between something that's a distraction, you know, like going to a dance, something you really don't, you know, be nice to do, you don't really have to. Mm-hmm. You know, there's all kinds of thoughts associated with that, the meeting the girls and all, meeting people and whatever. And an action that's um, like, a, like a pure action. Can you talk about that discernment? Because, you know, you can, we, we can't just sit there and be content, you know, action happens. Right, right. Um, I think part of part of this this understanding or whatever it is is that nothing I do is going to create contentment. Nothing I nothing I do actually has any meaning apart from like just its own its own purpose. You know, its own purpose that the action serves, but it's not actually it's not actually adding anything to what I am. So it, it, it seems like the general approach to life for most people is that they need to do things to progress. And it's like there's some, there's some unknown um, final state that we're going to reach at the end. You know, like I, I go to school and I have this job and I do all these things to be a better person and all these things that I'm doing are going to are are actually are actually improving something or adding something to me, so that at some point I will be complete and I, I will be content. So um, I I feel that it's very important for me to see that that whole operation only actually exists in thought. Only thought is making it seem like. I actually can can gain anything from any experience. So if I see that, and I'm always attentive to that, I realize that nothing I do is actually making any difference in what I am. So then with that attention, there comes a clarity in being able to see what, what um, considerations of actions are just distractions or are just attempts to add to what I already am or gain some kind of contentment and what actions are, as you said, pure actions or just things that things that are actually just happening, you know, in the same way that that anything happens, the same way that a tree grows or a bird flies through the sky. You know, these things happen, but can we really say that there's any meaning or purpose behind those actions other than something that we would prescribe to it? So, yeah, in, in that same way, these, these things are just happening and, and we can allow these actions to just happen without the idea that they're actually going to bring me anything other than what I already have. And, 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 it's, and it's interesting being here at the Krishnamurti Foundation because before I came here, I had, I had read little amounts of Krishnamurti and I was kind of familiar with his teachings but I always kind of felt like I was somehow beyond them. Like I had already explored the ideas that he was talking about and, you know, uh, Nizargadatta or Ramana or these other teachers were far beyond what he was talking about. And so I was only interested in what they were saying because they were talking about a more absolute reality, whereas Krishnamurti approaches humanity um, as having you know, like a basic 
a basic problem in the way that the, in the way that humans are living. Um, mm-hmm. And I always thought I kind of was just like, oh, Krishnamurti is just whining about nothing. Like, doesn't he see that there's only one reality and that there aren't actually separate individuals and there is no suffering? And so I kind of thought that he was just like kind of, you know, dealing with elementary ideas. <laughs> Yeah. But um, since I kind of had like my own insight just from actual experience, which is the insight that I was just describing to you, I've kind of seen that Krishnamurti is always talking about exactly what I just explained. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not in any way to make him into, you know, some kind of like master of truth or anything. But I just I thought that was interesting that uh, I have this new, uh, this new appreciation for what he was doing um, that I never really had before. How did you get that intern position? Are they hard to get? People might want to know. Oh, um, well, you can go on to the website, the kfa.org website, or just Google Krishnamurti Foundation of America. Um, and then on the website, there's an application you can fill out. Uh, this is actually the first year that this internship is is happening here. Um, so it's a totally new thing, and we're kind of pioneering the basic structure and system of the whole thing. Uh, so I didn't actually have to fill out an application. I just came here for... I was invited here by a girl that I met for a dialogue because uh, she thought I might be interested in exploring the, some of the topics that were being talked about and I came and I met Yop who is the executive director of the foundation and he's the one who started the intern program so I was still in high school at the time and he told me that if I was interested I could join the program after high school and that just was like the perfect opportunity for me I can't imagine a more ideal thing to be doing right now because I, I didn't have any interest in going to college because I don't, I don't really like have any desire to gain or accumulate any knowledge about any particular um, occupation or career at you know for the time being at least. Um, so I just uh, I talked to Yop about it and he said that I could do it. And then after high school, I I spent the summer with some friends and doing some work on a friend's uh, farm. And then in October, I decided to come here. You must, have, I mean, you have friends like outside of the internship. I mean, do you get into the, any conversations about these topics with like your friends? Yeah, I, I do sometimes. Generally, it's, it's, that's not like the, that's not really, that's just not really like what we're doing when we're hanging out. Yeah. Um, but, but definitely, I mean, I, I feel like, uh, you know, anyone can be open to exploring these types of things. And that's actually um, another impediment that I've recognized in in taking like an absolute approach to it is that like when I would talk to my friends about like when I was reading I Am That and they'd ask me what I was reading, you know, they would have some kind of understanding about what I'd tell them. But for the most part, it was kind of just like, too radical for anyone to like it, anyone to really have any further discussion with me about because if I tell them like you know what you are is beyond this appearance and you this whole thing is contained in the reality of what you are and nothing can be separated in that then there isn't really much further discussion <laughs> um Although I did have some friends that we like to talk about that together and just get really excited about it, you know. Um, but now, uh, now I just have like, I feel like I have um, a great clarity in communication and in what I'm really trying to get across to someone. Um, so that plays through in all aspects of my life. So when I am with my my friends that I've known, you know, for the past five years and that I'm very close with, there is like a new dimension of communication with them where I'm able to like really listen to what they're saying. And if, 
if there is some conflict that they're talking about or or if there's some confusion going on, it's usually pretty easy for me to understand the root of it and expose that and and just kind of like bring clarity to the situation. And when they are interested in exploring different thoughts or experiences that they've had, I'm always right there ready to do that. Do, do they come to you sort of, you know, to talk about things uh, in their lives in order to get in order to get some clarity? Um, for the most part, the people that I'm very close with, uh, don't really come to me like as someone that's going to answer their questions, uh, generally because most of my friends are, are actually pretty content as they are. Um, and they've, you know, come to that contentment in their own ways, but it's, uh, you know, yeah, if they do all know that I love talking, <laughs> about and, and inquiring about those types of things. So definitely, um, you know, they would know that I'd be open to that if they did have something they were interested in talking about. You said, say, just a minute ago that this clarity and communication that you've, is it, you said this clarity and communication is fairly uh, um, a, a newly discovered thing for you. Do, you. do you know, is that just something that just arose out of, you know, for whatever reason, or what do you think about that? Um, well, it it did arrive, it, it's become like more of a primary focus for me just recently, kind of at the same time as all this, this other, like kind of the letting go of the um, like idealism and finality of, of non-duality. Um, and like the importance of really listening to people has has exposed itself as being something I'm very uh, interested in right now and, and practicing because it's become um, kind of appalling to me and disturbing that when I'm talking to someone so much of the time rather than just giving complete attention to the entirety of their being and everything that they're expressing in that moment, I'm paying atten more attention to my thoughts and ideas that are coming up about what they're saying. And, I'm, and, and out of that comes this urgency to speak. Um, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about when, you know, when you're in a conversation with someone and, and you can't help but you know, like say what you need to say and, and interrupt them. Um, and, and so I've just been observing that a lot lately, you know, and, and really asking to what extent am I really giving full attention to the person in front of me? Um, and to what extent are, is everyone doing that? And when I really observe, it seems that there's a lot of, communication in which that's just not happening um it kind of feels at times as though people are speaking just to images they have of each other and you know reacting to ideas with other ideas and i feel that if i you know if i am able to let go of the ideas and not only and not just listen to the words that someone is speaking and and you know divert my, my attention away from just the words and the interpretations and rather give my attention to like what the person really is expressing and, you know, not just expressing, not just the meaning they're expressing, but like the actual reality of their being, you know, if I am able to let go of just the meanings and the words and interpretations, then this whole new like totality opens up where where i can see that this human is existing in the same way that i am and they contain the whole you know the whole complexities of of living life as a human and they contain the whole reality of being 
within them right in front of me and I'm missing it if I'm only paying attention to the, their ideas in the way that, that my ideas conflict with them or agree with them. And so like there's this new depth of listening that I'm exploring where I, you know, I can really look deeply into someone's eyes while they're speaking to me and see like this, this, in, this whole ocean of, of awareness and beingness that's contained in them that is exactly the same as what's contained in, in me and what I experience myself as. And so if I can pay attention to that in communication, then I'm just utterly in love with everyone that I speak to. And it doesn't matter what they're talking about. If, if they're talking about, you know, some opinion that completely opposes my own opinion, that doesn't matter at all. And, and from there, we can, you know, come, we can communicate a lot more clearly and, and lovingly without reaction. This, uh, you know, disposition of really listening, how has it played out for you in, in terms of, you know, relationship? I mean, specifically, I mean, you, you said it, that, that, that this is essentially love and, um, you know, just kind of with individuals, perhaps. I mean, how has it kind of played out relationship wise? Well, I definitely don't get angry with people anymore. I, I um, my dad and I and my brother all have. Um, have very short tempers. <laughs> yeah, you remember your dad saying that? Yeah, he's had that problem, yeah. Yeah, and, and so, you know, in the past there have been many times where I was, I was really quick to react, and I, and I actually even enjoyed, like, just unleashing that rage upon someone. <laughs> mm. I, yeah. I, enjoyed, I enjoyed just letting go and, and allowing that anger to come out. Um, and so now I kind of like, if I'm really listening to someone, and this isn't to say that there's anything wrong with anger, because I don't feel that way at all. But when I'm really listening, there doesn't seem anymore to be an opportunity for a reaction, um, for a reaction like that, that comes out of anger. Because if, if, uh, if I do feel myself um, in opposition to what the person's saying, and starting to feel reactive and feel some sort of anger, then I must not really be listening and paying attention to what they really are. So I haven't gotten angry at anyone in a long time, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and anger is an interesting thing. Um, I think that it it can come up just as you know, just as anything else does. Just like a, like a wave in the ocean, you know, like I, I'm alive and, and there's this beingness and then sometimes different energies will come up. Sometimes I'll be really excited and other times I'll be low energy and kind of tired and, and you know, not, not, that, not as excited and other times there'll be anger. Um, so I don't think that there's anything wrong with these things just happening naturally as they do but um i think what happens is these movements become personal when we associate them with meanings or we attribute them to uh you know different causes so if this ang this movement of anger comes up and i attribute that anger to what the person in front of me is saying now it becomes about the other person and how they're doing something wrong and I'm right. And it's no longer just this innocent movement of energy <laughs> or, or whatever it is. And all of a sudden now it's about me and them and that anger is perpetuated and it's given continuity. So I think in the clarity of just really listening and really being attentive to the fact or the reality of that other person, which is no different than the fact or reality of, what I consider myself to be, then, then that, if that energy does come up as like, you know, whatever, whatever that is, I'm not even sure, you know, maybe some like neurological reaction or something in the body or whatever kind of knowledge you want to make up to, to describe <laughs> it. Um, 
you know, that can come and then, and then it can just go as it naturally does. And it doesn't have to turn into like a blame thing and this whole confusion of, of, uh, you know, this outrageous, this outrageous confusion. <laughs> Sounds like if two people, two people are really listening to each other, you know, if it's a mutual kind of listening that it kind of, it goes back to, um, living without, giving much energy to distraction. Yeah. It's kind of an essential communic- uh, uh, kind of a communication. If two people are really giving that attention, <laughs> that's an amazing thing. <laughs> and everyone's, everyone's entirely capable of that. And it's not even an abstract idea, you know? You can really say that to anyone, and I feel like they, they can just experience it firsthand for themselves. Just really, really looking into this this other being, and and just loving and appreciating what that is, rather than getting caught up in the different meanings and misunderstandings. Because, like, in in seeing that, it becomes very clear to me that what I what I call I, when I say I when I refer to myself, I may be referring to the different ideas and images of myself as an individual, but what really accounts for that sense of being or that the fact that I exist is the same thing that you refer to when you say I. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, of course, in communication... And in language, there are the distinctions of you and I, and we, you know, we have to make those distinctions for the sake of speaking and because we are, we are different. I mean, I have a different body than you do. I have different preferences than you do. But if I can see that the sense of I or the reality of my being is not contained in those attributes or those preferences about myself, but rather it's completely independent of those and gives reality to those, those things, then I see that that is the same thing giving reality to your preferences and your differences. So, so even though in appearance there is a you and I and, and we are different, I, we can also see that you know, what is really creating this sense that I'm alive and that these things about me, that I'm 18 years old, that this is my body, that I like this and I live at the Krishnamurti Foundation and I play guitar or, or whatever these things ab- about me are, whatever it is that's making them real or making them seem like they really are me is the same thing that's making your attributes seem like they're you. And I, and I think that that, you know, that's really the core of what any non-dual teacher is saying or, or any, and I think it's also everyone, everyone knows that <laughs> whether or not they have actually come to that understanding clearly. I think that, that everyone has that sense or, or that it's, you know, right there available for anyone to see. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess some people you know, value it more than others and pursue it more than others. Mm-hmm. Seems. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Some people, yeah, I mean, obviously uh, you and I value that more because we're having this discussion, you know. We've seen, we've seen that and, and we're interested in it. <laughs> um, it seems like other people might not have seen it actually but but there's nothing more intimate and obvious than the fact that they are alive and i think that if anyone really inquires into that the they'll end up seeing that that fact is the same for everyone and it can't it, it, you know that that reality can't really be um you know said to be dependent of these separate people that sense of uh, 
those words you just used, this, the, the, you know, being alive, you know, we know we're alive. Mm-hmm. And that sense of that, I think in my studies of Nisargadatta, or the book I Am That, I, in my understanding is that he referred that to like the sense of I am. Right. I, I don't know if that's your sense of it or not. You know, a lot of it's just interpretation. Yeah, I have that same that same sense. That that's what Nizargadatta was referring to when he said I am. And he and he says in a few places that his guru instructed him to just follow the I am. I think those were that's a quote from the book to follow the I am. I think again that, that might be. And I think what you were saying in the beginning is that you sort of took uh, Nisargadatta's instructions to uh, to do that or. You know, perhaps you'd word it, you, you worded it differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love yeah, go ahead. And I, uh, yeah, Nizargadatta is interesting because I've read a, a, quite a few different books um, that contain things that he said. And, and he will say completely contradictory things to different people. Um, you know, like the the book consciousness and the absolute which has like the last the last um questionings that he that he ever or the last discussions that he had with people before he died um really like gets down to the roots of what he was saying and there will he'll be talking to one person and say that say that you are only consciousness and none of its contents can touch what you are. And then he'll say to another person that you aren't consciousness and you're entirely beyond consciousness even and prior to consciousness. Um, mm. so, so that's where, you know, I see the importance of not, of not taking any statement to contain complete truth. Because if I were to read... Nizargadatta and think that everything he says is somehow like representing absolute truth, then I'm going to get really confused when he says that. But if I see that he's just, you know, he's speaking to different people and, you know, meeting them where they're at in a way that they might be able to actually, you know, understand what he's saying, then, then I can like then i don't rely on the different words that he uses but rather i can just get a general sense of what he's really saying of what the real message is behind it and i think that that's really important um but but yeah with 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 the i am um that is what he he seems to generally say to people is that if you you know like he may say that what you really are in reality is completely prior to consciousness and has nothing to do with anything that you experience. <laughs> but, then, but then, you know, you, no one can really implement that knowledge in any practical way. So it seemed like what he, what he did say to people is, like you said, to stay with the I am because that is the closest thing to what you really are um, that you can actually experience in this, in this consciousness. Yeah, and that you can do. I mean, you, like you said, you can stay. You know, you can obey that instruction to stay with the I am. Yeah, you you absolutely can because it's you know, it's uh, like I was saying before. It's just such an obvious fact of existence. You know, it's like it. That's it. If if you stick with I am, then. Uh, <laughs> he also says in the book I Am That, I mean, he has a lot of, he refers to the I Am often. He also refers to beyond I Am often, mm-hmm. you know, like you said, you know, you, you know, beyond consciousness. or So, yeah, your person can be confused unless they kind of, you know, kind of understand that, uh, that there's, uh, you know, there's an approach that has traction, you know, that you can do, you know, you can follow the I Am, you can be aware of it or connect with it. You know, um, you can know it. And then, you know, this uh, claim of something beyond I am is, is, isn't, isn't, doesn't really have much traction. It's not that doable. 
Yeah. And and that's actually um that's interesting that we we came to this discussion because at one point I was reading that book, Consciousness and the Absolute, and I read a statement that he made about being beyond consciousness. And when I read it, it hit me in it like had such a strong impact on me that for like a month after reading it, I was like completely experiencing myself as being beyond consciousness. And I don't really know how to explain that in any other way. Um, but, but I do know that when I was experiencing that, I felt like that was it. Like, all right, I get it. I'm beyond consciousness. This is it. I, this is reality and this is how it is. And I'll never experience myself in any other way. Um, but then, <laughs> then I met a girl that I really, really liked <laughs> mm. and things got kind of weird when it seemed like she didn't like me as much as I liked her. And then all of a sudden I was back in consciousness, very much being affected by, by my experience. Oh yeah. So I think that that, that story, you know, at least for me, what I got out of that was I saw that like, if I ever think that I have reached some final understanding or that I'm done, that that can be a very dangerous thought because it may very well be that I just understood something and I'm having an experience, um, but it can I can very easily just fall out of that experience. So like mm. that kind of taught me not to not to allow truth to be contained in any one statement or or state of being like like uh you know because i thought that what nizar gadada said was absolutely true and i had that experience and i thought that it was absolutely final and true and then i saw that just a girl could bring me out of it it kind of just like it shows me that there's there's complete value in everything that nizar gadada was saying and there is it is pointing to uh, some kind of truth, but like that truth is, is like, um, it's not, it's not actually contained in any of the words and it's not, it's not contained in anything. And I feel like that truth is the same, like truth that all of the religions, uh, are kind of like powered by, or like all the religions are really looking at this one same truth in all these different ways, but then because people think that that truth is actually contained in the specific teachings of the religion, they get caught up in that rather than just like exploring that truth for themselves through experiencing things and, and, I, and you know, observing and understanding what's, what's happening to them. So then talk about this listening, what you what you called really listening, when it comes not just to talking to a person, but when reading, you know, reading this Arcadata or reading, you know, religious scriptures, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, what's really listening all about when it comes to it comes to that? Well, I feel like um, that's a great question. Um, if I'm if I'm really reading something or really listening to what I'm reading, then I'm not I'm not just reading the words. And creating, um, creating concepts that I think are true out of them. Um, you know, I'm not just like reading, uh, you know, that all is the absolute, and then saying, okay, that statement is truth. Or I'm not reading that Jesus was uh, our Lord and Savior, and saying, okay, that is true. But rather, I'm reading it and allowing allowing the words and their interpretations to be perceived and allowing whatever um, understandings to come out of that, but never making anything into a truth that exists independently of, of, um, of anything, you know, like it's, it seems it's so easy to, to let um, a statement become something that is like inherently true when really I, I don't I don't think that truth is contained in anything in that way it's more that I can read this thing and 
and someone else was writing it coming from their own experience of truth and their own understandings and inquiries. And so I can read that. And then from that, by looking at the same truth that they were experiencing, have my own understanding of it. And then it doesn't have to be so, so stagnant in the sense that I, that it, that I think that the truth is only contained in the specific words and the structure of the words that, that that person is, is, uh, expressed them in. So why don't they teach this stuff in high school? You know? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good question. You're like, I don't know. It's, it would be, it would be really tough to, I think, it it would be tough to teach that because it when you teach it it seems like it becomes like a an authoritative thing where the teacher is telling you that this is true and then the same kind of thing plays out that I was just describing where then the students think that whatever the teacher said is true so like i guess the question is how can an education system encourage a student just to inquire into the truth that is their own being and and explore it further and understand it by observing their own thoughts and experiences rather than like creating an external truth that is independent of them did, did you have i mean because you're fresh out of high school did you um did you, have, did you have any glimpses of truth if you will from any teachers, you know, uh, or even going even prior to high school, anything stand out? Anything anyone said that you remember? Uh, let me think. <laughs> you uh, got to think, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, obviously nothing too big if I can't remember it right away. Uh, hmm. I feel like this is the type of thing that after this interview, I'll, I'll leave and I'll remember something <laughs> okay. that someone said. Um Nothing's really coming to mind right now, though. I mean, different things that my father said definitely stood out for me. Because um, we've, you know, been exploring these things together. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. no, I, I don't, I can't recall any specific things that any, any teachers in, in yeah. school or any, anyone said, as of right now, at least. That's interesting. Now you were at the Science and Non-Duality Conference last year, and, and you know there's not many younger people there. I, I did an interview with Ella, Ella Joy McGilvery, who's uh, who was who's 15, and she was there. I don't know if you hung out with any other people. Yeah, yeah, I did actually hang out with Ella. Yeah. So the conference was an interesting experience for you, I guess. Yeah, it was. It was great. It was a lot of fun. Actually, it is fun there, yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. I, I didn't go to a, uh, a lot of the talks, really. I went to more of the experiential workshops. Mm. And I went to a few talks. Um, but for the most part, it was kind of just people like saying things that I felt like I could be saying. And like <laughs> I wasn't really impressed or uh, influenced in any way by any of those types of things but mm -hmm. i did really like just meeting people and and spending time with people and having our own discussions about things yeah that seems to be the cool part about it or just taking a walk with someone or something mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, I really like that I, I definitely intend to go again next year hmm. i want to thank you very very much for your time this was fascinating and you are a real clear communicator yeah you could be up there talking about this stuff <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm doing interviews with younger people, and I think that, um, you know, no one's talking to, you know, your generation, you know. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing um, how many people I know that are my age that are very clear in communicating these types of things and these understandings. It's, it's like, it's totally incredible, actually. <laughs> I really wonder how, how the, this whole non-duality movement is, if you want to call it that, is going to is going to change as a result of, you know, of you guys, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like a very, uh, I feel that this generation is, has a very questioning approach to everything. Like, yeah. 
no one seems to be too quick to disbelieve anything. And mm-hmm. and I really like that. And I like and I feel like there's a lot of I, I there's a lot of real connection and real listening um that happens with people with people that I know that are around my age group. Especially here at the foundation. Well thank you, Sage. This is, this was great. I really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, I, I really did enjoy this as well. This went this went really fluidly and and the time and, uh, the time went quick. Yeah, an hour and twenty minutes. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, it did anyway. yeah. Cool. I, so, I really appreciate um, uh, having this opportunity, and I thank you for this. And and I um, I look forward to meeting you at some time and talking to you again. Yeah, we'll meet Sage. Thank you. Have a great day. All right, you too. See you. Bye. Goodbye.